Hello, everybody. Happy Friday morning. Even though we're recording this on a Thursday, this will be up for you guys on a Friday morning. I have the beautiful Cindy back, who is one of my in real life friends. I, I feel like I'm old because a lot of the slang the kids say I don't know. And I learned that IRL means in real life. So Cindy is one of my IRL people that I know her in real life. Didn't meet her on the internet like a lot of my other YouTube friends. We actually have known each other for many, many, many years. And I'm so excited that Cindy's finally coming out and like te showing the world what she's been doing for years in her own little school. But now she's putting herself out there more publicly because in my opinion, Cindy is definitely a light worker. She's definitely a healer. She's here to help people. We all have a Dharma and a purpose in this life. And I really feel like Cindy is one of those people that it's like, ding, ding, ding. This is her path because she is so powerful and she has helped so many people. Oh, we just lost your face, Cindy. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The weather in Georgia right now, it's very thunderstormy. So we've had a little bit unstable internet. So you guys will have to forgive us um, if things happen. <laughs> Man versus nature. Nature always wins, right? Oh, we lost oh you again. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I hope it doesn't keep doing this. Okay. Well, your picture is beautiful, too, just as you are. So. Okay. <laughs> um, so, and I want to bring up to uh, Cindy and I were kind of talking off camera about what we were going to talk about today. And I know that like 99% of you guys are going to just dig this conversation, but I know that, that what we talk about, especially with like stuff that kind of challenges the, um, accepted narrative on spirituality can be very triggering for people. And the one thing that I would just ask that those people who do feel triggered that instead of lashing out in anger at people when they maybe present an idea that uh, bumps up against what you've been taught is to just examine that trigger within yourself. You know, it's not as Cindy and I've talked about in other episodes, as far as like triggers, that's just something for you to observe within yourself. It's not, nobody is responsible for your feelings about things. That's feelings and opinions should be things that are always evolving and changing when new information is brought forward. And I know that I shouldn't have to say that because most of the people watching are going to totally dig this conversation because this is kind of a growing on a topic that we've been talking about a lot on this channel and with the Jesus strand, the um, project that I've been working on with negative 48, um, Sabrina Gal in Toronto, where we've been following kind of the bloodline, the literal bloodline of Jesus. But we know that Jesus and his spouse, his partner, Mary Magdalene, who I've kind of called his shock fee from time to time, which we can talk about what that is too, Cindy, um, mm -hmm. about her divine teaching. And if you joined us on the Dark Outpost Tuesday, we had Janine on our lovely tarot card reader, Janine, and she looked into the cards and basically a lot of what was removed and edited out of the Bible that we have today was having to do with the divine feminine mm -hmm. and the power of the divine feminine, that yin and yang, that balance of feminine and masculine energy. And we see that a lot as male, female bodies, but divine feminine can also live within a man and the divine masculine can also live within a female as well. So when Cindy talks about Mary Magdalene and this idea of what she's teaching, it's not just, we're not just, re it's not a women's group. We're talking about this energy that she brought in her teaching because she was a teacher to all, both men and women. So and everything in between under the rainbow. So, um, so Cindy, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you. And I'm super excited to be talking about all this magical, mystical things because uh, Mary Magdalene, Magdalene you know, she believed in that kind of stuff. She believed in, um, and, uh, the, you know, there's different ideas too about her lineage and where she came from as well. And uh, there are things that say that she was a, a high priestess, that she was a high priestess of the Isis and Hathor lineage. Yeah, and uh, her name is Miriam. You know, Miriam and Magdalene uh, means. Um, uh, <clears throat> I wrote about this the other day, but the, it, it means like strength. Her last name is strength and and tower. The tower of strength and power. That's what like Magdala or Magdala. The way it translates over is a, as a as a lineage or as a person of tower and like power and strength. Right and. Uh, um, you know, her teachings. Yes. Can you talk a bit about, cause I know some people are going to be confused about the ISIS thing. And I know JC down in, in uh, Australia has spoken about this before. A lot of these, um, ISIS have like, they've been smeared 
for a particular oh, reason. And so I just wanted to make people aware of that. Like we are unraveling so much about the truth behind these. Um, we'll just call them characters or entities for now, because we're still trying to figure out what exactly this lineage is. And if you guys remember from the Jesus strand as well, they have pushed or put out the theory that, and we had a military insider back this on David's channel that Jesus himself was a Druze, a D-R-U-Z-E, which is more of a, has very much a lot of found finding in Hindu faith. So we're looking at, we're starting to discover that there's way more complexity and simplicity. It's both complex and simple at the same time um, that we were not taught or made privy to. And a lot of it does have to do with these elements of what we might call magic um, mm -hmm. and working with it and being a part of it, which is a huge part of the yoga practice as well with the nature. So can you, can you explain that? Sometimes people are going to hear magic and they're going to immediately think like uh, dark arts, um, mm -hmm. you know, bad stuff. Can you explain what you were talking about? We were talking about before we started filming about this tool of magic. Yeah. I mean, basically for me anyways, is you use magic as a way to, um, to formulate relationships with not just the seen world, but also the unseen world. So when you, uh, in other words, how do you connect with Mary Magdalene if you want to connect, for instance, with her teaching or um, the teachings of anything else, that she's an ascended master, you connect by creating some kind of sacred space around it with ritual and with ceremony. And this magic, it's not, yes, you know, sometimes we think of the idea of magic and we think of the dark arts, but it's a very neutral, it's, it's like energy, it's just energy. Energy is neutral. And you can either take magic in the ceremonial ritual rites and use them to connect with the higher beings of the light, with the fifth dimension and higher beings of light, or you can use ceremony and ritual to connect with the lower beings of light. <clears throat> So it's a neutral force, but it depends on how you're going to use it and what relationships that you're going to be establishing. And that these relationships, um, the way I use them anyways, is in a life affirming way, you know, ways that affirm my life and the way that uh, affirms my teaching so that people can also understand that it's not um, when you connect with these with these other beings or these other um, entities that they're not trying to take their power away from you. When you connect with the higher beings of light, they're not going to do that, but they will assist you in connecting with your own sacred power and your own wisdom. And, you know, that's another difference, I think, between the higher magic versus the, the lower magic is when exactly. you connect with the higher beings of light, with the ascended ma masters, they're going to take you. I mean, yes, they're helping you. You're communing with them, but they're not ever going to take the power away from you. They're only going to enhance your own. Yeah. Does that make sense? And usually yeah. when it, you work with the lower beings of light, um, you know, they're, they're, used, they're manipulating you. They're using you for their own, you know, whatever their own agenda is. Where the higher beings don't necessarily have an agenda, they're just wanting to help you spread, you know, your your word and your light and and the, um, and uh, empower you and to help you see yourself as like a sovereign being. So, you know, I think those are the differences between how you use the tools and the ceremony and the rituals of magic. Yeah, that's how um, it's like the if, if for those watching who, you know, Cindy and I lived in the deep South. So we understand like, you know, God, the devil, light, dark, you know, all these different words people use to identify these, these beings. And mm -hmm. we know that from our studies into like the C-A-B-A-L, I have to be careful what they say that, that the dark entities will give you power, but at a cost that you always mm -hmm. have to give the devil his dues. Mm -hmm. Whereas God or light beings, angels, they are they're there to service you and to help you and love you you know it's 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 like service to others versus service to self which is what the, the law of one talks about which is the same mm -hmm. thing and so yeah and it's like i was telling cindy we said this with janine too one of my teacher over in india you know when we look at like tools you know that we use tarot cards whatever it may be it's the tool itself is just a tool. It's, it's right. It's neutral. It's totally neutral. It's the intention behind it. It's the conduit behind it. And it's like the knife, you know, a knife can be used to hurt someone or it can be used to cut up fruit to serve someone, to feed someone. Mm -hmm. The knife is still the knife, right? It's the action behind it 
that it's giving it its purpose. And that's one thing I think that is part of this transition into this new timeline is we start understanding how powerful we actually are. Exactly. We determine that. We determine mm-hmm. the outcome of that tool. The tool doesn't do anything. It's just a tool. Mm-hmm. It's us that is giving that life to that, that tool. So exactly. And there is like ceremony and ritual and you do work with the idea of reciprocity. In other words, giving and receiving, but you play with that in a way as like natural law, you know, that we're always um, playing within that natural law of when you give, you receive. And so when we play with that idea in um, these forms of magic, the offerings are, they're not like, you know, you offer yeah. a rose, yeah. you offer honey, you you're offer not, you're not red wine, you offer, <laughs> you offer tobacco, yeah. you offer milk, you know, you offer things like this as a way of just, uh, of, um, of claiming that this, this ceremony of this relationship that you're, you're establishing is important to you. So it's like, okay, I know that you're, you're giving me wisdom. And so here I offer you this, you know, this rose or offer you this wine in, um, you know, as, as a way of saying thank you, as a way of gratitude for the exchange of that wisdom, which is like indigenous cultures. I mean, yeah. all indigenous cultures pra- practice this form of reciprocity when they're connecting with the elements, especially, or, or any other beings, any other beings of light. It's funny. My so that's the is- difference in the ceremony. Yeah. You know, yeah, my boyfriend, it's, he leaves. So and, uh, Cindy knows my boyfriend. I think some people think I've made him up because he's never on the channel. But you know my boyfriend. <laughs> yes, I do. He's yeah. real. I've seen so him in really person. Good. And uh, we have a picture of his guru from India and our and Cindy Bendar Shala. She knows it's right up front. And, and Todd, my boyfriend's guru, loved coffee. And so mornings Todd would fill a little cup of, of coffee and put it on top of the picture because his, his guru is no longer with us. And so mm-hmm. he'll leave. It's almost like mm-hmm. he learned that um, offering from his time in India. Cause as Cindy will tell you, my boyfriend is a white redheaded man. He's <laughs> not, he's not from the East. He's very much from the West, but he learned that. And so he still honors his teacher and will put a little tiny, just a tiny little, like almost like a shot glass um, of coffee up on top of his painting or his uh, picture sometimes just as a way for him to honor his, his the, the t- wisdom and teachings that Guruji gave him. So, um, so yeah, I get that. It's very sweet. It's very touching when exactly that do that. Yeah. And the yeah. spirit world knows the stuff you're giving them. It might not be important to the spirit world, but it's because you're giving it to them. You yeah, know, it's coming from the heart, from your heart as a form of gratitude for the information and the wisdom that you're receiving. Yeah. And guys, I know the audio might sound a little crackly right now and I apologize. We are, it's all, it's stormy outside. So, um, just bear with it guys, man versus nature, nature always wins. So we're just, pretty we're just, much. <laughs> I feel like this is kind of off topic, but I know my boyfriend has been following for a long time. The, and I can't say this word on, uh, on YouTube, but the, the trails of things that have been in the sky for a long time that they've been putting mm-hmm. on the earth. And mm-hmm. now we know that's been reversed. And so the earth is like healing itself. And so we're getting these like pop up weather situations, which is literally just the earth cleansing itself, which is amazing. So we're happy that the earth is able to, as a living, breathing being itself can like heal itself too, just like we heal ourselves. So just bear with us guys with the audio. It is a little, a little stormy outside, but anyway, all right, back to Mary Magdalene. So I was telling Cindy, I was born in 1983. So I was 16. And what year would that be? Like 1999. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I have this memory of walking to class in high school with my backpack on my back. And at this point I was living a normal high school experience. There was no internet yet. It was all, you know, I went to Sunday school. So only thing I knew about Mary Magdalene was what the church had told me was that she was Mm -hmm. a sex worker, which we know that wasn't, that wasn't really true. Um, and that, you know, she, Jesus had healed her, but all of a sudden I was walking and I, the name Mary Magdalene just like very profoundly hit my head. And I just remember it like it was yesterday. And you said that that happens, right. That she will actually kind of like tap you on the shoulder sometimes. 
Yeah, when the, some, these ascended masters, they come to you, especially some of the, the, the divine, sacred, feminine masters, they come, that's exactly what they do, is uh, they'll give you a, a, a little tap on the shoulder, like a little awakening, a little imprint in your brain, in your mind, and it's like a seed, it's like they're planting yeah. a seed with that. And then as you continue on, and especially if you've been like praying or putting it out there in some way, shape or form, whether it's conscious or whether it was part of your soul contract, that you're here to expand, to awaken, to ascend, you know, these seeds that get planted, they start to perky, they start to grow, they start to percolate. And suddenly, you know, you'll start seeing Mary Magdalene stuff everywhere. You know, suddenly you'll see a book or um, she'll start bringing in her teachings in these different ways that make sense to you at the time. Yeah. And it, it's almost like your initiation into her world and into her realm. And yeah, yeah when I first got into it, <clears throat> it was... Um, uh, I used to go to a unity church, which is like a, a new thought church. And that they uh, teach more of like new thought, more open-minded principles of, or it's more uh, open-minded principles of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And they do talk about Jesus a lot, but not just within the realm of the way it's taught in the Bible, you know, they interpret it in different kinds of ways. And, um, the, and it's, you know, I think it started off with me healing my, um, me healing my relationship with the idea of Christianity and Jesus, Jesus himself and what his, his true teachings are. Yeah. And then as that began to uh, strengthen, then boom, you know, Mary Magdalene came in pretty much right after that. Yeah. And they were uh, here. showing herself as being an equal, not like this, you know, this lower being than Jesus, even though she often referred to him as the savior, mm -hmm. she was in ministry right alongside with, with Jesus himself, yeah. you know, that she had, in a, so she had a, she was born into a lineage and was taught information mm -hmm. that also um, uh, helps people with their awakening or their ascension. And, this, yeah. you know, she was doing it way back then and that was during a time, yeah, when women were subjugated. Mm -hmm. So um, when uh, Constantinople came in and take, took over in the, the, the third to four hundreds, I mean, women were still being highly subjugated. And so they had to do something about that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. had to hide the fact yeah. that she was actually there alongside in ministry with with Jesus himself. And yes, they were like the Shiva Shakti, like you were yeah. talking about. Can the, you explain what, because I tell people all the time, oh, she was a Shakti. Will you explain what a Shakti is um, to our audience? It's like the, the aspect. So the Shiva is considered the, the more masculine for, force, I think, it's, it, or it's more masculine, but it represents more just like that pure, pure consciousness before anything is even created. But mm -hmm. the second pure consciousness decides to create itself, it's Shakti. I mean, yeah. it has to come within the realm of Shakti. So the, the, the creative aspect of life, all of that is Shakti. The material aspect of life, this planet that we live on, this, this form that we take in our bodies, in other words, the, the instance we start living life Mm -hmm. Shiva expresses himself as Shakti. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. It's like right. Shiva Shakti. And this and so is my God. Sacred marriage. It's the sacred marriage between like the consciousness and bliss. It also is the same thing as Chitananda. Yeah. You know, if you hear Chitananda, Chit is consciousness, Ananda is bliss, and that is the Shakti. So it's that yin and the yang. It's always together. It's always in mesh together. You really can't separate the two yeah I was so like about shiva shakti with jesus and mary magdalene i mean they you know it's a, when you talk about that sacred marriage you can't have one really without the other right i was telling my class on sunday afternoon our we started a new beginner course at our business and i and i was saying um this theory is so because a lot of this we find this heavily in yoga is really fun to talk about but then when you start to really think about it it's like whoa <laughs> it's, like, it's mind-blowing it's a psychedelic trip it is like 
Um, I, I laughed. I told them that t- my boyfriend's teacher, before the uh, Westerners started coming to India, he had this saying, um, 70% practice, 30% theory. But then these American, these West Europeans and Americans showed up and all they wanted to do was sit around and like smoke and drink coffee and talk about philosophy. And Guruji was like, you got to actually practice this. So like, no, 99% <laughs> right. practice 1% theory because you can't, your head will just like totally like, it's such a, an, an, uh, like, what is it? Um, like the unattainable unicorn, the unsolvable riddle, which is what David Greek, my original teacher would call it, the unsolvable riddle because they can't exist with, we study them in, in juxtaposed to each other, but they absolutely intertwine in, mm-hmm. in life and in, in energy. And it's uh, like in the gospel of the Holy 12, which was a beautiful gospel we read here. That's a band book. Um, God, uh, Jesus refers to God. We have been taught our heavenly father. But in this missing gospel, he calls God mother, father, mm-hmm. never one without the other. Yeah. Exactly. Mother, father, father, mother. It's, they're always that, in, that, that being is always interlocked with these two divine paths. Right. Well, yeah, but you can't know Shiva without Shakti. No. Like you can't, like your mind can't even wrap itself around this idea of Shiva. You need Shakti in order for you to even begin to comprehend what what it is because it's in our human form with our brains and with our senses and and the way that we experience the world we experience it through shakti Mm -hmm. so you go through shakti to be able to understand like that pure consciousness you know because our mind usually can't wrap itself around that because even the, the second we start to talk about it like us talking about this is Shakti. Yeah. Everything. Our comprehension of it is Shakti. You understand? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the second it comes into any kind of form of manifestation of talking, of thinking, of breathing it and experiencing it, it comes in, in the form of Shakti. Yeah. No, so I you love can't that. Know shit, you can't know shit without Shakti. At it, least it not us in this form. Well, and I was thinking, as you were saying that too, like when we talk about Mary Magdalene, we know that the church tried desperately to get rid of the divine feminine but how powerful was she that even through all their editing processes even though they got rid of 711 books that probably a lot of them probably spoke about that she still she still became a a main character if you want to call her character in the new testament that's oh yeah all the process of them trying to eliminate her she still Mm -hmm. was there they couldn't couldn't do it they couldn't no, do it. So I mean, they just can't, tried to can't take it out. They just turned her into like, you know, the, the like a prostitute, something Street that worker. would be yeah. more acceptable to the, the narrative that they were telling in the Bible. And even, you know, Mother Mary, I love working with Mother. Like, <clears throat> I love working with Mary Magdalene. She comes in a lot of times in some of the healing sessions that I do um, with women, especially for, with women who are needing to re-empower themselves. But Mother Mary, too, is like this divine mother. She also in, in the history, she also has a lineage. Yeah. And she was actually a very powerful woman. And, uh, you know, the grandmother and Jesus's grandmother, Anna. Yeah, we've talked mm-hmm. a lot about her as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah. This and um, what's interesting yeah. is that Mother Mary comes in a lot when I work with men when they I mean, they, she, he, he come, uh, she comes in when I uh, work with women too, but a lot with men who were having issues with their relationship with their mother. Well, look at her. And son. she yeah. just comes in with like this divine mother, like true mother energy and just like, bam, you know, this is what, mo- this is what unconditional motherly love feels like. That's mother Mary energy, like this unconditional mother love that's going to love you no matter what. That's Mary. Like that's Mother Mary. And that's part of the divine feminine too, you know? It's like that aspect. That's one of the Mary, you know, Mary yeah. and then and then the, the um Mary Magdalene who, you know, represents a, another aspect of the divine feminine as well. Somebody told me once and I don't know if I'm going to say <clears> this right. This was a long time ago that with the divine feminine there are like three stages. There's um the daughter the queen and the mother. And it seems like they all have different like aspects of personalities. And with Mary Magdalene, I see more of this like queen aspect where she's very tough and strong. And we know like historically from the research we've done on her, that she was far more educated in a Mm -hmm. secular way than most of the males. 
She could exactly. read right. She, mm-hmm. she, a lot of the male, the men that were with Jesus in that group didn't know how to read or write, but she did, which was so rare back in those days for a woman to be, she wrote her own, like it's believed she actually wrote her own gospel. No one dic- she didn't dictate it to anybody. She could write mm-hmm. it herself. Um, and then we see like the mother aspect, that strong mother coming through mother Mary that you're talking about mm-hmm. that real unconditional, like mama bear, you know, and you think about the it's strong and enduring, yeah. like, Imagine being a, a, having to hold that energy, especially when you're seeing your son having to go, what, you know, what he went through yeah. and you're having to, to hold that space for, for something that's just so brutal, you know, in, it wasn't um, just one son. She had to watch go through that. Uh, Jesus' brother, James also after mm-hmm. Jesus was executed, um, and his brother was running the temple in Jerusalem. She had to watch her other son also go through the same, you know, that's how dangerous this, and, and that's yes. why, and I, I, I opened this talking about the triggers. Like we think this is triggering now for people. It was triggering back then too. That's why these people had the lives they lived just because that was, you were giving, they were giving people this, key, this key to freedom within themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, I know historically a lot of people thought when like, you know, all that happened that it was going to be a heaven on earth. But it was like, Jesus, like, no, heaven's inside of you. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a throne. You got to <laughs> find that inside. Of you. And that's a lot of Mary Magdalene's teachings too, about exactly. finding this. Um, and you were uh, the book, you had a book, right. That you said that you use a lot. I like this one. Um, it, it doesn't just have the gospels, but it's Mary Magdalene revealed. And it's by Megan Watterson, and she um, studied ministry and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, she puts a lot of her own personal points of view uh, because she starts she studied, especially like that early Christianity, early, Mm -hmm. early Christianity, because she always said that or in her her book, which is what you might fit or what I felt like for sure, because I grew up Catholic. So I mean, I have a, a connection to Christianity in that way because I'm Spanish. I'm from Peru, so my Span my Spanish family was, you know, they still are. They're they're pretty devout Catholic, and um, but one thing about that though is it did bring me an appreciation of of Mother Mary. Mm-hmm. But anyways, she was talking about how, or in her story in her book too, how. She just didn't, she was, she felt like she was Christian, but did not relate at all whatsoever to the Christianity that was being put out there. But as she began to study, for instance, the other gospels, because in here, I think she has like the gospel, you know, some of the gospels of Thomas and, mm-hmm. you know, the one that are in the, the Naga Hamadi. I don't know how yeah. you say that. Yeah, that's it. That's but right. she has some of those, the, um, some of those gospels in here as well, that then, Christianity started to make sense to her mm-hmm. because, you know, it looks like you feel a calling, you have a yeah. hunger to, to learn, to know, but then you know that what you're being fed, there's not something, you just intuitive, you know, that there's something not right, or there's something missing or what's going on here. And uh, so you might not, you, you might be really attracted to like the teachings of Jesus and all that, but you just knew that there was something missing. That's what she talks about in, in her book that, I think I can relate to, and a lot of people, a lot of other people can relate to. So, you know, you're, you're, you're a Christian, but you're really not. I mean, you have, you you believe, but you just don't buy into or or feel in your heart, the narrative that's been put out there. But then when you start to see what else is out there, you're like, oh, okay. Now this makes sense. This I can follow. This I feel in my heart. This I understand. And not to say that everything in the, the, the canonized Bible is incorrect because, you know, there's some good stuff in there as well, but you just know, it's like, there's something you can see missing. (laughs) When we we read through the gospel of the Holy 12, you could actually go through the gospels and see where sentences sentences had been like cut out and edited. You can see where they removed chunks of the story. And Mm -hmm. I love that you're bringing that up because I've had a lot of people on my channel say that as well. Like I never really felt comfortable at church, but I always loved God and always felt like Mm -hmm. an outcast because I had this weird like juxtaposition where I loved God, but I wasn't comfortable with what I was being taught. And now things are making more sense. So I think, and that's what um, negative 48 and my friend prime minister have both said this. And I know people are going to speculate because everybody thinks, you know, they know who negative 48 is wink, wink. But uh, Mm -hmm. he said in the, in the new, in the new world, 
the new timeline we're moving into and why everything's so chaotic right now, things like religion are going to fade away and faith is going to fly. Mm-hmm. That we're going to, we're not going to, we're going to have such an awakening within us that we're not going to need exterior dogmatic rules put before us by another mortal, or we're going to be more comfortable within, within our own understanding of who these people, who these beings are and our relationship with those beings that it's so personal that nobody else is going to be able to come in and start to like triangulate us with God or with mayor or mother, father, whatever, whatever the universe you want to call the universe. And so I think that's so beautiful. And I will put guys, I will go and find that book and I'll put a link to it in the description box. If that's a book you want to order. So you can just click in the link from the box to, to get to see the book. But um, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, gospel of Mary and some of her teachings? Well, there is one, because then the one we were talking about was like, okay, well, what, what, what do we want to um, talk about this time around? And besides Mary Magdalene and magic and all this stuff, it was also about like just how we get in our own way. Mm-hmm. And Mary Magdalene, uh, this is Mary, I guess, Gospel 9.18 to uh, 25. And she talks about the, the, the seven things that, well, the, I mean, the, the way I interpret it, the seven things that cloak our heart yeah. or that cloak us um, from being able to see or, or fully understand. In the Yoga Sutras, you know, we would call that the kleshas, but there were five of those, but Mary Magdalene also had her seven. And the, the first form um, is darkness. And, uh, um, and as I was reading it through this book as well, and, and the way that Megan interprets this is darkness it is when we feel that heaviness, that despair, you know, like, you know, that sadness, just that inertia that begins to come in, and we can't see beyond our own grief, or our own, um, you know, our own sadness. Yeah. And then the, the, the second one is desire. But, you know, thinking of desire, the way I think of it and the, the way she was interpreted to is like, a, like addictions, like desire when it turns to addictions or to attachments yeah. to where we feel like we need this thing so much that we this desire or whatever so much that um, it takes us away from like really knowing ourselves or, you know, we use the desire or addictions to hide from ourselves. You yeah. know, um, so there are strong desires, whether it's, you know, through addictions or, or uh, sexual desire. Of course, there's nothing wrong with sex. But if we're we're using it for for to cover something up, right, you know, or if we're using it to to not see something about ourselves or, or we get um, so lost, maybe sometimes in the pleasure of whatever it is that we're getting into that we become attached to the pleasure and forget that we can also like that pleasure is inside of us. It, it, you right. know, talking about that same thing of you can create the joy and the pleasure from within you. You don't need like this extra thing. Like the extra stuff is just extra. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and Patanjali says that as well in the yoga sutras, mm-hmm. that everything you need, you have within you. Mm-hmm. And I know uh, Ram Das, I think we spoke about Ram Das last time where he said, uh, and he, um, had a little bit of a issue with, um, I don't know if I can say this. I might have to blurp this word, bleep this word out, drug abuse. Um, and Cindy knows his whole story. I'm not going to get into it. You guys can look up Ram Das, But he realized from his experimentation with that, that God was basically tapping him on the shoulder, being like, that feeling you had, you can create within yeah. yourself without this extra stuff. Exactly. That's what I uh, got uh, when we were talking about last time from my ayahuasca experience, which was was like this pure hell experience, because Mm -hmm. like that voice inside of me said, you don't need this drug to know God. I was like, you needed this to see what you were doing to yourself, but you don't actually need this to know, to know something bigger, to know God. So it, if that's what you were wanting, that, too, too bad, so sad. You weren't going to yeah. get it. Yeah. See, right when you said that, I thought, you know, I just had this thought. I was like, and the same thing goes with like the dogmatic teachings of any religion, not just Christianity. Mm-hmm. You don't need that to know God. Mm-hmm. You exactly. don't need it to know God. You just need you. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think that's what, you know, they mean by like desire, your attachments and mm-hmm. how that can take you away from your, from yourself. And then the third one is ignorance. 
And I, and I think this is just when the stuff is so subconscious, Mm -hmm. you know, that, um, or we just don't know, you know, or we don't know something about ourselves or something is just buried so deep that we're ignorant about it Mm -hmm. until we become aware. So, you know, I think the ignorance thing is, um, we're all working on that one. I think, you know, every day something new is being revealed or uncovered. Um, yeah, human beings. So. That's part of that's part of that thing. That's part of the path for every human is to <laughs> find where those those uh, blocks are of your own knowledge. You know, there's two there's two sayings. One is ignorance is bliss, but the other is knowledge is power. Mm-hmm. And exactly. as my one of my boyfriend's teachers used to say, bliss can be blistering. Oh uh, yes, it absolutely, absolutely can be, <laughs> or, or at least your path to bliss yeah. <laughs> is definitely blistering. blistering. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the fourth one is zeal for death. And so, um, again, I was like reading her interpretation, which kind of makes sense to me. And this is like when you do things that are unhealthy, <laughs> like it's a zeal for death. It's like why when you know this stuff is really, really bad for you or like eating this thing is bad for you or doing that thing is bad for you. Why do you do it? Mm-hmm. You know, or it, that it can take away from your longevity. It can take away from your health. It can, you know, just take away from your quality of life. It's yeah. uh, the, that zeal for death. And I think, you know, when you're talking about self-sabotage, that, that, I feel like that could uh, go within that, within that category. Like, why do we self-sabotage? That's a whole other series, I think. But why do we self-sabotage ourselves? Why do we have this zeal for death? Why are we afraid of our own life and yeah. our own power? And why are we afraid of just being really powerful and, um, and like, taking in life to the fullest? Why do we dole ourselves or, you know, why do we make ourselves smaller or um, because, you know, you see so many people that would rather choose, they choose death rather than awakening. Yeah. Because awakening is you have to face all your demons and all your fears. Right. Yeah. And you're like, forget that. I'll die. Just yeah. give me <laughs> death <Yeah>. instead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so, uh, they say like in our community, in this uh, truther community, they say there's a red pill where you wake up, but there's also a black pill that comes with the red pill where you go into like a deep depression when you mm-hmm. start to become aware. And you, and I think a lot of people fear that they fear that understanding that everything they've believed, Oh, we lost your face again, your beautiful face. Um, that everything they've believed in this life is, is, an illusion. So therefore they don't want to go through the pain of that. And we've talked about this before, but within that darkness, within that pain, when you work through it and you get to the other side, it's liberating. Yeah. I mean, eventually it is liberating. Once you've processed all of the the stuff that you have to process, the processing part isn't pretty. It's not fun, but once you get through it, yeah, there is like this, this clarity that comes to the other side of that. If you're just willing to go through the, the shadow of the valley of death to get to that. And that's to the that Bible side. too, though, right? Yeah, that is the Bible, that. man. Well, that's what we're talking about that too. I mean, speaking of, we talked about how mm-hmm. people get really triggered by this information that wasn't brought forth in their churches. But there you go. There's that black peel pill. That sounded really Southern peel uh, <laughs> where you realize that you have been fed a bunch of, of crap basically. And once you let go of the attachment you had to that lie, that illusion, and you go, wait a minute, but the truth is so much prettier. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you. It's like my friend Tamara from Australia says, thank you. Cancel. Thank you. Kids. Yes. You know, uh-huh. I, you know? <laughs> so, so I think people who are triggered by this stuff, they're, they're hitting up against that, what Mary Magdalene is talking about mm-hmm. that idea, that zeal for death of, of not, you know, wanting to move through it. So awesome. Yes. All right. And then, um, the, okay. So that's the zeal for death. The fifth is the realm of the flesh. And I think we have to be careful in how we interpret that because there's nothing wrong with the flesh. There's nothing wrong with the human form. 
<clears throat> but it can go wrong is if, if that's the only thing that you identify with. I right. mean, part of the divine feminine path and the Shakti path or the tantric path is that you have to go through your flesh mm -hmm. in order, or you go, one of the paths is you can go through your flesh to connect with the divine. But what happens if you just get stuck in flesh? Right. And you forget that there's a divine within you and you're just stuck in flesh and nothing else. That's the yeah. hardest, I think, though. I told <laughs> everyone stuff in my, because Cindy takes, I, I teach on, at Cindy's uh, Shala, her yoga school on Sunday mornings. And I talk about this all the time because it's, they say the teacher talks about what the teacher's trying to understand. <laughs> yes. but, uh, you know, because it's so bad. And that's the yoga practice itself. We, we've talked about in one episode that we use these asanas, these postures, and we get kind of uncomfortable in order to kind of trigger the flesh. So we're using it to understand we're more than the flesh, but yet we mm -hmm. have to use the flesh and exactly. the sensation of flesh, which is connected to the sensation of thought in order to realize we're not just flesh and thought. It's so like, exactly. I mean, you could yeah. probably write a dissertation just on this one concept alone, you know, oh, on all of this, you can, I mean, you can yeah. go so deep into each and every single one of this. That's why, well, the more you know, you realize the less you actually know. That's what I realize every single time I learn something. I realize, oh man, I just really don't know anything at all, do I? <laughs> I thought I love that. Well, there is a quote. I think it says, "The more I learn, the less I know." <laughs> there is, yes. <laughs> there's, there's that other quote. A, a, a wise person once said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, I Might as well. Um, and then the sixth one is the foolish wisdom of the flesh. And the way I interpret this is an undisciplined, like an undisciplined mind or body. Like for like if you had absolutely, um, like n no discipline for yourself or for your life or no kind of like reverence for life. And you just just gave yourself into your samskaras, you know, what we call just your habits. Yeah. You know, you'd be sitting on the couch eating like a thousand donuts and potato chips and watching hours of streamed TV. Um, kind of that's of like the <laughs> foolishness of the flesh. But the foolishness of the flesh is from like an undisciplined like an undisciplined life or an, an undisciplined body or an undisciplined mind, because without the discipline, I mean, yes, there's a, there's, there's some stuff within you. That's not always, it's always going to make the right decision just automatically. You know what I mean? It's like, you have to train yourself to, you know, walk the path that you want to go, because if you don't, you can like turn into like this sloth that is, you know, again, unhealthy or disconnected or, you know, like eating all the donuts. Not, not that I have anything against donuts. I guess I say donuts because I actually like donuts. So I have to make sure I don't, I have to make sure I don't eat all the donuts <laughs> and all the potato chips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no. And that we call that in, my boyfriend talks about that a lot too, because, you know, when you're doing a yoga practice, you have to be disciplined. Like, cause we mm -hmm. talked about this on Sunday, Cindy, like, uh, you know, you have a honeymoon phase where you're like, this is amazing. But then once the honeymoon phase is over, that's when the real work starts because you have to, I'm sure Cindy and I probably, I know I can speak for myself. Most days I'm dragging myself to my mat and yeah. making myself do the work. And I don't want to, I want to mm -hmm. lay in the bed and eat Sleep my, until noon. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Noon, I want to eat breakfast in bed. I'm, pardon me. That's that, that, that kid inside is like, I'm an adult now. I don't have to, you know, like, you yeah. know, but I know that, that the work as hard as it is every day, that there is a discipline. And my boyfriend also kind of interchanges the word discipline with devotion that you have mm -hmm. to have this devotion to that path. And that yes. devotion means that you just, it, it, it's a powerful, it's not just, I'm going to do this because I have to, it's because there's purpose. Um, mm -hmm. why I'm restraining myself from eating. Cause I'm like you, Cindy, I could literally go sit at Dunkin' Donuts and just, that'd be my happy place <laughs> no. all day. That'd be my happy place. Actually, exactly. one time when we were in India, we saw they opened up this like donut shop and we had been there for a couple of months. So we were like, oh, we have to go get these donuts. And we were so excited. Todd and I were just laughing about this the other day. And we got there and we got donuts. We had like a box of donuts and we got them home and they weren't like our donuts. And we were like, <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, like, and you're like, oh man. I was like, that was God just going. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. I think, I think a lot of people, I think that might be actually out of all her, her obstacles, that might be the one that most people watching probably can understand the most because as adults, especially, we know we have to have a, dis- we under- we have the lot, kids don't have that logic adults mm-hmm. do of why mm-hmm. we can't always be doing what we want to be doing. Instead, we have to be doing what we need to be doing you right. know, in order to keep ourselves where we need to be. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cause what you want isn't necessarily what's, it's going to be what's, what's uh, best for you. Now yeah. some people like hearing that because there's some tea, you know, like all this other newer teachings that are out there too, that says, Oh, just, you know, do what you want and all this wonderful things will happen. And yes and no, it depends on where that desire is coming from. Right. Is that desire coming from the highest place of your heart, from your higher self, or is that desire coming from, you know, a lower part of you that's actually wanting to sabotage, to self-sabotage. And yeah. that's where I think a, a practice, some kind of a practice comes in handy so that you can begin to determine between the two. So yeah. Okay, where's this desire coming from? Is it really coming from, my my highest most magical best self or is it coming from you know some other some other place that just wants because it wants and you know what I, you know what i mean the insatiable so, yes. yeah <laughs> it's, it's kind of like i i personally have like kind of an issue with the whole like body positivity movement because of that now i think that the sentiment of being body positive is is good you mm-hmm. should always love yourself regardless of what you're struggling with and have that self love however this movement has taken it to the extreme where i've watched um other youtubes of people being like bully because they've decided to lose weight or you know they've pushed this idea of 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 being in a place with your body that's not healthy and is causing an an imbalance in in your your psyche almost where you know you should still as one of my friends said yeah even if you're you know overweight or something and you want to lose weight don't you love yourself in the process that should be the the body positivity but you know that we are, and it's not, and I hate to like pick on like people overweight because we all have these issues. We all have, whether it's mm-hmm. weight, whether it's addiction to cigarettes or, you know, to whatever mm-hmm. caffeine. I mean, I know I'm addicted to caffeine, you know, like we all have these different things we have to work through. It's just, I think that the weight issue is more evident, you know, then, and that's why they started this whole movement. Now it's kind of backfired and it's like, well, no, we know that anytime there's an imbalance in, in the, in the psyche or in the body that we need to like observe that and see what's causing that. We talked about that earlier in the past to see what's causing this type of like attachment, you know? So, um, so yeah, I think, yeah, especially here in America, we, uh, we, we want to like, I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I need. And I know even like the young, I, uh, we always, the generation below us were always like, but, uh, you know, I know yeah, when we were kids, Cindy, like we had to work for things. We, you know, you got out of school and you got the low pay job and you had to work up and it was expected that you would share an apartment with like five other people because, and now kids are expecting it because they want, they want, they want. So it's, it, it is opening up this path of not understanding the discipline of, of, of where you're going into low vibration. So if that makes sense, I hope that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, yeah, it's, but you need to tune into that. It's like, is this desire, this want coming from low vibration? It's a good way of putting it. Or is it coming from a, a high vibration that's going to, again, be life affirming for me instead of taking away? And <clears throat> I think one, uh, I read something that makes sense. It's like, because sometimes if something has short term value, like short term, it satisfies you short term. But long term, it's going to cause a problem, then you probably don't need to do that thing. You know, so you can look at it, you know, short term versus long term, like short term, it might be very satisfying. But long term, like, how's that really going to affect you? You know, yeah, Yeah. it's like, do something today that your future self will thank you for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I mean, I'm selling Cindy and I have both been practicing every day for years. And it's not it doesn't get eat. You still have to, I mean, every day you still have to force that discipline and that devotion because. Well, I think there's a, there's a certain commitment to the path of like wanting of, to expand, expand consciousness. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, it depends on how badly you want it. Yeah. And, and, and I think a lot of that is you either, some people have a, like a big hunger for it. And then some people don't, and that's okay. If you don't yeah. like my husband does it. 
he doesn't have a big hunger for awakening or anything like that, but he's just fine. You know, he's just going along with his life and everything is good. That's not his dharma. Yeah. But no, I'm glad, yeah, because mm-hmm. there is, we know that. And I had a spirit, I can't remember who said this to me. It was years ago. I think another spiritual healer said, we live, we have like active lives and we have passive lives. Mm-hmm. So like my sister has a very passive life. Life has come very naturally for her. Or have I yes. been through a lot of, obstacles and hardships but we grew up in the same household we you know but it's just your growth and after an active life usually you take a life of rest Mm -hmm. so it could be that your husband is resting this life to Mm -hmm. rebuild to then come back the next life and jump up again you know so and and then there's nothing absolutely there's absolutely nothing wrong with that you know um but then sometimes yeah you're born with like this hunger and to like really want to know more to awaken more you know and and you you just kind of like put on this path and if you are dedicated like if you if that that hunger or that um desire see that's the highest desire for me that's a higher desire um you know, you'll do the things you'll, you'll watch what you eat, or you'll wake up every morning and do your Ashtanga practice, you'll, you know, you contemplate, you'll study, you'll read, because it's inside of you, you, you can't help it. I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you don't have like this deep, deep hunger, it's okay, too. Yeah, I mean, don't think like, Oh, my gosh, now I have to wake up and I have to do this and I have to do yeah. that. And I have to practice every day. <clears throat> that may be the path for you, but it may not be. And that's okay, too. You yeah. know what I mean? And but, I tell people, you know, that's funny because I tell mm-hmm. our beginner students all the time because, you know, at AYA at our, our shala, it's like, you know, we do six days a week. And I'm like, that might not, I actually said it the last Sunday. I was like, you know, that might not be what you do right now. You might just do mm-hmm. two days a week. You might do three days a week, you know, you know, and, and, and it does. Uh, yeah, there's no, there's no cu- cookie cutter one size fits all. But again, that comes back exactly. to Mary Magdalene and these, these, true Christian teachings, which were very mystical, that it's, you know, the original Christians were called, or historians, let me rephrase that, historians call the original Christians, the Gnostics, that's why Mary Magdalene's gospel is considered a Gnostic gospel, they didn't call themselves that, they just called themselves themselves, but (laughs) Gnostic, they're just, I'm just me, Um, Gnostic is a Greek word, it comes from Gnosis, which is inner knowing, inner knowing. So, so yeah, what I love, I'm glad you brought that up, Cindy, because every single person, and I just got through recording something for the channel that won't be released until Wednesday, but every single person, every single person, as, I, as we just said, you don't need somebody else to introduce you to God. Mm-hmm. You don't need somebody else. That's, that's, you have people like Cindy or myself or other tomorrow that are going to help you show you paths, but we know this like Pratyahara self-study you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Like all Mm -hmm. that inner knowing has to come from you. Nobody else can like push a button on you to make that happen for you. And Mm -hmm. so, and so I'm glad you said that. So if, if what we're saying doesn't resonate with what you're feeling, Cindy and I've been on this path for a really long time. So, Mm -hmm. so um, it's different outlooks, different perspectives. So what works for you, what Mm -hmm. you feel like is your highest greater good, then that's awesome. You know, and for her husband and for many people, that's just smiling every day when they get up out of bed. Your exactly. husband is the smiliest person. Like, he's like the nicest, kindest. Like, so is Cindy. They're a perfect couple. They're a really pretty couple, too. <laughs> their, their kid is really, really, they, he struck the genetic lottery. So, um, so. Yeah, he's pretty cute, though, my son. Yeah, my husband's pretty cute, too. But yeah. <laughs> very attractive couple. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's all. And, and I think people who are comfortable with their own spirituality and their own work are also comfortable with other people's place as well. And exactly. Their, yeah. You, know, you yeah. have that, that respect for other people, other people that try to get involved in other people's you know, relationship with the divine. That's obviously says a lot more about that person who's mm-hmm. projecting themselves into when you're trying to change that person. Yeah. Right. Instead of letting them just be in awakened in their own um in their own way and in their own timeline yeah yeah because everyone's timeline is different too absolutely and todd my my boyfriend says that i know we may have talked about this before because todd has been teaching for about as long as cindy i think he's 24 years now they're they're both been teaching for a very long time Mm -hmm. and um he says he's always said one of the hardest things for him as a teacher is that he doesn't know, you know, you, we say karma is your work. You, you have your karma, you have your work. And he doesn't know sometimes, like he'll try to step in 
and kind of guide a student. But sometimes he says, you know, I have to let them make their mistakes. I have to let them. I don't know what kind of karma or work they've already mm -hmm. agreed to before taking this incarnation that's going to help them. So I can't get involved in that. And that is, that's so true because yeah, every person has their own agreement that they've mm -hmm. made before taking this life. And so right. that's not our job as human beings to intercept that because every person has to find that within themselves. And that is, to me, my opinion, that's kind of what Mary is saying as well as you mm -hmm. have to, to thine own self be true. You have to like find that within you, you know? Exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. And do you want to go over the clashes too? I mean, well, she has seven, right? We didn't go through all seven, did we? This is, there's one more. The okay. last one, the seventh is the wisdom of the wrathful person. And <laughs> I know, and there's so many ways I think to take that too, like the wrathful person and the anger <clears throat> because he, because I find it interesting is that she she didn't just say which I maybe you can help me interpret because I don't you know I per, I'm personally still trying to figure this out. It's she says the wisdom of the wrathful person, not just like the angst of the wrathful person, but the wisdom of the wrathful person. So I think there's something to that as well where. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know. It, it's the way that we also process and look at anger, where anger um, anger can be a positive thing because it's what propels you into motion. Yeah. You know? And it's what drives you to inspiration to make change in the world and to make change in life. But so, so the wisdom of the wrathful person, like that's where the wisdom can come from. But if you just stay in the wrath, though, and you stay in the energy of anger without letting it propel you forward, then that's a very dangerous place to be. Yeah. And Miss, Miss, mm -hmm. I loved how you brought that up because you're right. We have to get, like, we're seeing that in the world right now. And I have to be very careful about what I say. Everybody knows on YouTube, but Cindy and I've had these conversations as well. And of course we've had on this channel, we're seeing some pretty ridiculous things happen right now in our world. And part of, part of that is to piss people off enough to get them to do something. Mm -hmm. you know um and so but when you take that anger and you use it properly again to propel propel change mm -hmm. to make it a better place for yourself to understand yourself more to understand your own for us now on this timeline it's to understand our own sovereignty you mm -hmm. know that that we don't belong to anybody we belong to ourselves but the wrathful person if you take the anger and you project it in an unhealthy way onto other people, that's when there's danger. But when you're actually able to like acknowledge where you're, cause a lot of people have anger issues. A lot of people, you know, you look at people have misplaced anger where they just explode um, mm -hmm. of the slightest thing. And that's come from something else. So you have people like, I feel like I do this where I'll hold in anger for so long where it almost becomes like a pressure cooker where then I just, mm -hmm. like, just cry and I don't, you know, it's like, we all have to learn how to take that because all emotion we have, anger, joy, happiness, laughter, and everything is coming from a, a, a thought mm -hmm. and an emotion that's attached. That's what, what might make me angry might not make Cindy angry, might not mm -hmm. make you angry. What might make me laugh might not make you laugh mm -hmm. because we're all having our own. So, so yeah, I think that wisdom and, and finding that nugget of where that, um, potency for change can happen does that make sense am i making sense <laughs> yeah i know um well yeah well because anger is a useful emotion in that the way i see it you get angry when you feel powerless mm -hmm. like if someone tries to take away your power in some kind of way it's like anger comes in to set boundaries right to say wait a minute you're overstepping here yeah, and the anger begins to set boundaries for yourself or for your people, for your tribe or yeah. whatever, you know, and but it's almost like you have to alchemize your anger to mm -hmm. certainly like you have to see it as that as like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm so angry right now. But you can take that anger into like negativity or vengeance mm -hmm. or something. It doesn't quite alchemize the way that it needs to. Or you can work with that anger in a way to where you understand that, okay, how am I, how am I feeling powerless here? What right. boundaries am I actually needing to uphold for myself 
And how can I then use that wisdom that I got from the anger? So the anger gives you that wisdom, that knowledge, and then act from there. Do you see what I mean? So it's like, yeah. so it's yeah, like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's something like you have to alchemize it. You have to process it through instead right. of staying in the anger or and, put it and misplacing it, taking mm -hmm. that anger and throwing it onto somebody else. Like we were talking about and using that information to put the boundaries up so that you're, and you find that how many people ha are people watching? Have you ever been in a situation where you were being bullied or something? And the minute you calmly stood up for yourself, you felt better. Mm -hmm. you yeah. it in a proper way, instead of taking it and throwing it on someone innocent. That's why we talked about in a prior episode about Patanjali and Ahemsa, meaning nonviolence, where he tells it, he doesn't say peace, he says pick nonviolence. So you're able to filter through the emotion and set a boundary. That's not, that's not being violent to the person that's pissing you off. That's just taking care of yourself. And you're right. Just, yeah. So yeah, I, I like you, that way you explained it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, yes. we do, we do. Ha and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, growing up in a, cause I grew up in a Southern Presbyterian church, which down mm -hmm. here, so Cindy's a rarity down here in the South. We don't have many Catholics down here in the South. That's more what well, I, I listen to this podcast about small town murders. And they always say like Catholics, the Baptists of the North Baptists, the Catholics of the South, because in the South, <laughs> it's a very evangelical, like Protestant. And we're yes. taught to be like as women, I know in the uh, we're talking about this on David Zublik's channel as well. Speaking of the divine feminine, as women in some of these like unhealthy Christian churches, we're taught to like almost be doormats. You know, women are kind of taught to like, right, yeah. And 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 that is, you know, that is misplaced. You know, when you start to get angry, when you know some, you know, that is that is divinity showing you. You don't need to be treated that way. Exactly right. And you should be someone treated other that way. Yeah, someone that oversteps your boundary. Someone is trying to take away your power. Mm -hmm. Someone is trying to siphon that power away from you. So yeah, take yeah. it back in a way. Yeah, and I think that's part of the divine feminine too is being able mm -hmm. to. You know, you think about Mary Magdalene and Mother Mary and how strong of women they were. They were graceful women. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when I think of Mary Magdalene and Mother Mary, I want to hug them, mm -hmm. you know, like they would be very loving and protective of children, but they also, they're not going to, what, what is that saying? Do no harm, but take no shit. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and they were, I mean, both Mary Magdalene and to so the wife of Jesus, I think we know now that was his wife and he was married um, and his mother sat there the whole damn time and watched him leave this earth. Mm -hmm. They watched the one man they both loved in different ways, in different ways. Yeah, but, yes. you know, they sat there. The male disciples didn't hang. They were they ran off. That divine feminine. Yeah, they're exactly. Not. They're the ones that stuck around and had the grit. Yeah. To take it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many I've heard so many stories. You have a child, Cindy, of when the, the kid gets sick, the husband is always like the kid starts throwing up and the husband's like, huh, too. But the mother <laughs> right. like, come on, man, you know, like help me with this. So the the kid skins its knee and the mother is the one that has and the husband's like, huh, you know, I like, can't even like so that divine feminine has been so squashed and it's not saying that there's not power in the masculine. I think that's one, one way, like our modern day, like women's live has kind of gone awry where, Oh yeah. I, yeah. Men are not less than women. No, we're equal. We complement each other. The, the, pow it's the, the same power thing. Has. It's the Shiva Shakti. It's the yeah. sacred marriage. We, you know, we need each other. Yeah. Regardless of whether, and, and I, I don't, I mean, don't mean to say, because I actually do like my best friend is gay. Like I, and I know Cindy is very supportive of, of everybody, you know, in their mm -hmm. own sexuality. So we're not really talking about it in more of a, it's more of just the energy aspect yes, of, these, yes, yes, of yes. these elements. So a man can be also carry divine feminine. A woman can carry divine masculine. In fact, most of us do have a balance of both within us. So, um, so yeah, it's so beautiful. I think I just, in my mind's eye, I see Mary Magdalene as just being this just gorgeous, like almost like Amazon type, like, you oh, know, I know. With this just brown empty. skin, beautiful brown hair and big eyes and luminous, you know, yeah. really radiant. 
when we yeah. were studying her gospel, we, this was probably like, oh God, months ago. She was one of the f- first, I think we read Thomas first and then we read Mary. Um, I did a huge deep dive on like her folklore with the Cathars because we talked about the Cathars as well, which was her lineage of teaching. Um, we know that she ran off to um, Gaul, which is France now, the South of France. Um, and she didn't run off, like she had to abandon. They basically like had to go to exile um, because of what they were teaching. And there were all these stories from the South of France where, you know, she lost her husband at a young age. You know, we know now that Jesus was actually 36 when he, when he lost his life, not 33, which makes sense because that equals nine, which is a very divine number. Um, And there were stories of after she taught for years and years and years and created this Cathar line, she basically went into the wilderness because she wanted to just like die in peace. But the story goes that she Mm -hmm. just didn't die. Like she just kept living mm. and it was kind of, it was kind of comical reading some of these stories. Like she kept wanting to leave the earth and she couldn't, she had to like stay a lot longer of a life than she wanted. Cause she wanted to move on, you know? Yeah. Very well, you know, the, and then just taking that back, all the way back around what we were talking about in the beginning and magic and everything and her being like this priestess of a higher order. She was a magician. Like mm-hmm. she was a mage. She mm-hmm. knew how to, to make the sacred connections, like sacred connections with Mother Earth mm-hmm. itself, and you know the sacred connections with the higher beings of light that she was working with at the time as well, and that you know it was from all that teaching, you know, from her pre, like she was a high priestess. Yeah, she went through some pretty extreme teachings to become that high priestess. So she had magic in her. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, just bringing it back around to this idea of magic and and ceremony and ritual and making these connections with the, with the unseen forces. She was, she was a master of that as well. I'm glad you, we've talked about that a lot before. And I really want to emphasize that with people who are thinking, Oh, this is, you know, Hollywood makes that kind of stuff look fun. But it's, it can be, it's, it's, it's the path less, less, uh, less taken because she got, I mean, I can imagine through her training, she got her ass handed to her multiple times <laughs> because oh, that's yes. what happens. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you were, I mean, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about what you've been through these last few weeks and we can't say the virus name because of uh, YouTube, but you got very, very sick. I did. I did get very, very sick. In, um, and it was also while I was exploring, it's, it's funny because I got very, very sick while I was exploring these teachings at the same time, because I'm, I'm running another course right now called Ascension, where we've been studying like Isis and Hathor, and, and we've been reading this Mary Magdalene book. And so right around all that time, same time, I got, I got sick. And, um, and I was, and I know you talked about, you know, your sickness too, like when you're going through transformation. So yeah. this, with, with, the, with, the, with the disease, um, I was sick for a good seven days, seven days of fever. I mean, it definitely had a bite to it. Um, and in about the, the third or fourth day, I had also started my cycle, maybe a little bit more than what the guys want to hear, but I had started my cycle. <laughs> And it was Grand bear guys, yeah. <laughs> I know. And it was like these this these three days of just major purging where I was in fever and I was under, I mean, I really feel like I was also under the influence of just this cleanse, this purge, you know, through fever. And then I was also like hemorrhaging. And yeah. it was um, you know, it was it was pretty, it was I mean, it was an experience, luckily, that my body could handle, you know, I'm healthy, luckily, you know, through the yoga practices and everything like that. So my body was healthy enough to to handle both holding the sickness and the, the, you know, my cycle and everything and all these, these, uh, these uh, mysteries, all this, these teachings coming in all at the same time. And it was, I mean, it, it was hellacious. I mean, it was like, oh my God, let this be over over with, please. I mean, it was rough. Yeah. But talking about about how, you know, going and you lose your appetite or I lost my appetite. So I I also couldn't eat much. So I had lost um, 
weight on top of that. So it was just like this major, I, I felt like my whole body was being rearranged, which I mean, I think it was, is that everything energetically and all that was just completely rearranged, turned inside out, spit out, <laughs> and then other stuff brought back in. And um, I'm just now, that was at the end of, you know, actually, um, I started to feel unwell the last time we, we came together. And that was when it's, when the unwellness started, the to, started. to come in. Yes. When I got, I got, Sine, we were talking about it at the, at her shala because I got a fever. Mine was different than hers because I didn't have any like respiratory stuff. It was just, y'all know, mm -hmm. I talked about a slow grade and I was real congested. I'm still a little congested. And, um, we spoke about it cause my boyfriend talks about, it. I did a video on it that, um, when you level up, like when your consciousness has to level up, one thing we don't understand in the West and this is taught in the East is that viruses, fevers, are a necessary part of your awakening to happen. And like my boyfriend's teacher um, used to always get excited when his students got like the fever or got, you know, kind of got their asses kicked a little bit because it meant that the alchemy of everything you were working on, your self-study, your work, even if it's something, sometimes I feel like in my experience, sometimes those breakthroughs where like those fevers come happen right after you've gone through a period of like self-doubt, mm -hmm. like nothing's yes. working and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you just get smacked and you come back and everything after you've healed, it's like, you've got this clearness in your eyes. Everything has changed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so Cindy and I were talking about that, that we both had, got, she got it worse than I did, but it was like, um, it was necessary. The universe allowed her to get sick so that stuff could be yes. like, yes. And not to minimize, cause I, I got the, you know, the sickness yeah. the, and, yeah. um, not to, to minimize it. I mean, no. like I said, I was, I'm in pretty good health. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to, to, to just make sure to, that I'm not actually downplaying, you know, for some of those who do get unwell, you know, yeah. but it also um, put into perspective how important it, it is to, to do your work and to be healthy, you yeah. know. And it, and it gives you a healthier appreciation, mm -hmm. I think, like I said, just a different perspective mm -hmm. on what all this is. It gives you a different appreciation for the grand scheme of life yes. and, and what, what, you know, we didn't come here just to sit back. Well, those of us, maybe some people, but those of us in the active life that want to, that have that hunger, that itch to scratch, we didn't come here to sit around and just watch stuff go by. We came here to pr actively participate and to understand that, um, and that, and, and that agreement to actively participate means that sometimes we don't go, it's not fun. Sometimes it's, it can mm -hmm. be very, it can be, your knees um in a lot of ways i think that's kind of like when you get sick during this stuff it kind of brings you to your knees i was saying it was kind of like a come to jesus moment but in this situation it was more of a come to mary moment yes uh, you know? uh -huh. um, well because it got it gets in your like when you're going through something that's more existential you know because i mean it really penetrated my mind it, it brought up some like shadowy things like shadowy beliefs shadowy things of that felt very like abysmal, but there, there were my shadows that I had to look at. And what I realized about this, this past experience is like, if you're having a bad day or something like that, you know, it might last a day or two and you're like, oh, but like this was going on for a couple of weeks. And even after I was starting to physically feel better, my mind was still like, mm, like churning. It was agitated that there was, it was existential. Like there was something that, this whole process was trying to show me again, kind of like how the ayahuasca showed me. It's like, Hey, you're just doing this to yourself. This is a social construct that you made up in your own mind. And, yep. you know, you're just doing this to yourself kind of a thing. And um, when I began to actually see that, and I was like, okay, then I was able to lift right. myself out of <laughs> yeah. the agitation, you know, yeah. Because we're always wanting to, even no matter how much work that you do, we do, we're, we're still always trying to blame it on somebody else. <laughs> and then it comes back. I was like, okay. Then, you know, once I realized that, that I was like, okay. 
then it, yeah, that's actually started, well, then things started to shift, you know? I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Actually, we could probably do a whole episode on how whatever something like that happens when we try to blame it on because that's such a human thing to do, to be like, yeah, this is, you know, to, to take that, you know, yeah, I love that you said that, yeah. <laughs> So, um, well, Cindy, we've been going for about an hour and a half now. I don't want to keep you all day. Now you have a new course coming up. Can yeah. You, uh, you- um, just speaking about the magic and connecting with your intuition, connecting with the, the, the powers that be the sacred elements. I have an initiation course that's actually starting on October 2nd. We always run at this time of the year. We do it once a year because this is when the veils are thinning. You know, we're yeah. reaching October time and you could probably feel it already. I probably don't even have to tell you like fall time uh, begins to, to do things to you where you like you feel change. And this, yeah. so we run it during this time because, yeah, and then like October, you know, Samhain, Halloween, the veils are, are the thinnest. And that's when it, you're more open to uh, to those unseen forces that you might have been closed off to before. And so we start by working with making the sacred connections with the elements, like with earth, with air, with fire, Not only because they're the easiest to start with, because one, they are, they're tangible. You can actually see yeah. it so that you, you can understand it in the more tangible way, but they also have benefits that are... Um, like that you that are not as tangible do you see what i mean right. it's like they yeah. they feed you in so many ways and so through uh connecting with the elements and we do it in the indian uh i'm indian my, my friend who does it with me she has more toltec wisdom i have more indian wisdom but it's shamanic in nature and through that that through that process we help you in developing your intuition like like you know, um, opening up your psychic gifts, you know, yeah. learning how to discern between your intuition and other things. We're both uh, master energy practitioners. So we do light body activations and DNA activations to awaken like your, your energetic body to more knowing. And um, yeah. So anyway, it's just, you know, it's a lot of uh, good stuff. Now, and, can people do that if they don't live nearby? Can they do it on zoom or does it, do they have to be in well, that, that's, well, we're, we may offer it on zoom, but this one it, we're doing it as a live experience. But um, we've tried it before where we tried to do it as a hybrid, a live experience in zoom, but that didn't seem to work as well. If there's enough, you know, we might, I think we may do a zoom where it's just zoom and they're not, you know, combined. So, yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But this so one, we're we doing it as a live experience. Um, but we might offer it as a zoom experience as well. So if people don't live nearby and they want to participate and, but you don't have a zoom offered yet, they can just contact you. Right. So you can kind of get it, the amount of people that would be interested in doing mm -hmm. something like that. Exactly. Contact all of her contact. I'll put down in the description box below. And I want to say to you guys, like, this is my favorite time of year, the fall. Like mm -hmm. I love this. Time of year. And I know that when we've been uncovering all this stuff about the other side of this game, the dark arts, they use this time as well. Yes. For their own purposes but what we'll go right back to swing back to we start in the beginning before everybody freaks out about that remember it's just nature we're the yes. conduit so i've said this about christmas about mardi gras like moving mm -hmm. forward we know there's been some sinister stuff happening but we you own that power where you can make it for your own benefit for the benefit of humanity whatever you want to call it so and i love this time of year and you're right there is a christmas and a um, it does feel, this is a magical time of year to me, this whole, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people love this time of year. This is a very sacred time of year for yes. a lot of people who don't even know it. They just feel that love in their heart. And so, you know, we talk about the veil being thin. It's not just, you know, when we first start awakening, it's not just the veils to the underworld that are thin. It's no, also, no, no. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, no, I mean, there's but, so much more out of there than just yeah. the underworld. I mean, exactly. there is a whole thing. Uh, you go higher and, and it's yeah. bigger. It's bigger than the underworld. Yeah, absolutely. And it's massive and it's expansive and it's just, you know, there's it so much you. possibility and potential. So just don't, you just go that way. Yeah, don't go that way, go that way. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you got to go that way to go that way, but I'm just saying, you know, when we yeah. think of the Vale City, you know, we always think, yeah, these, these darker forces, but there is so much more out there 
that is yeah. that and in you know and then the darker energy and the thing is i think bob marley said something along this line is you know the the the, e, the darker the evil or whatever you want to call it it's it's always working it's never giving up so neither should you i mean you should if you feel yourself called to do this kind of work i mean you got to work it because they're yeah. never going to give up you can't give up either yeah you well, no, to, you too, use like, it you just, to uplift you know you can use the same work to uplift the planet to uplift yourself to uplift humanity and we talked about this last time like and cindy will help you with this like the whole discernment between when you start to connect with the entities beyond the veil that understanding discernment of of you having that power to different differentiate between what's a good entity and what's a, a, a bad one. And Cindy can help you with that. Mm -hmm. You know, she can help you like not tell you, but help you find that, that information within yourself so that, you know, yeah. you know, that I discernment. Mean, between. Mary Magdalene is on the other side of the veil right now. Yeah. I mean, how else are you going to connect with her and her wisdom? Like really intuitively, you know, Mar mother Mary is uh, over there. Jesus is over there. And any other of these beings, ascended masters or deities that you, that you see it uh, as helping you they are they're on the other side you know so that's how you connect yeah it's the whole <laughs> the whole principle of the universe is free will so they're waiting yeah. for you to initiate yeah. for you like to, to remind you but they're 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 waiting for you with loving arms you know so mm -hmm. you might not feel loving at times when you go through those, <laughs> those lenses but <laughs> no but I assure you it is. Um, but anyway, so guys, I'm going to put all of that information down in the description box. Again, if you live near Georgia or Atlanta area, Cindy's in Marietta, we picked up an awesome new student at the Shala from, uh, from our last interview together. So that's, I'll give you a little shout out right now. I won't say your name because I don't want to dox anybody, but, but we have had somebody come into the school. So if you live near the Marietta area and you want to do um, her course, then you can come in live. Um, but if you don't live in the area and you're interested in, in doing like a group work with Cindy on this stuff, please contact her so that she knows how many people might potentially be interested in doing like a zoom type of program mm -hmm. regarding this this particular topic. Now, again, uh, at Sacred Garden Yoga, which is Cindy's yoga school, um, I will place the website link to that down in the description box below so you can see the schedule. If you don't live in Georgia and you want to take any of her like just regular live weekly yoga classes, you can sign up. Some of those classes she shares on our YouTube page, which I will link to that as well in the description box. But if you want to take it, a live class with Cindy as she's just teaching, again, not part of the course, but just in a live class, you can see the classes and the Zooms are. Please remember we are on Eastern Standard Time. So you'll have to figure out what time. So for class, what's like 11 o'clock in the morning here on Eastern Standard Time, you're going to have to figure out what time that is for your time zone mm -hmm. because it will be happening in our time zone. I feel weird having to even say that, but this is the world we live in. So, yeah. Um, so, so yeah. And then, of course, again, if you want to do the Ascension uh, courses with Cindy and you don't live in Georgia, just let her know so she can figure that out for a future date to start that with a group outside of of our hometown here in in the deep south the deep That's bible right. belt <laughs> <laughs> so i know it's so it's so funny because cindy you spent most of your life here in the deep south and you don't have a southern accent at all do you it comes out every now and then my husband has a deep deep accent i don't know if you ever heard him talk but he is southern so every now and again my it, I, I just can't help it <laughs> it does it come out when i'm drinking when I'm drinking, the southern accent comes out a little bit, but uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, it's, it's uh, it's our, our when I count, I feel I always giggle to myself when I'm teaching because, like, when I teach, I count in Sanskrit, and so I'm like, e I'm inhale, I'm, I'm using the Sanskrit, and then when we have a posture that's that's stable, I'll count in English, and it's damn it, it's every time I say four, I feel like I go four. <laughs> Did anybody notice that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was um, that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> now, now on Sunday, Cindy's gonna be listening for that. <laughs> Baller. <laughs> I was like, so, oh, there she is. <laughs> there it is. There's that Georgia. There's that Georgia yeah. right there. But it's funny. I will say my teacher in India, I don't think he can differentiate between like my accent and like an English person. I think that we I think he hears it the same. So that's interesting, even though I, we hear different accents. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, that's just just some humor there, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Cindy. I can't wait. Let's let's schedule something again and we'll go deeper into maybe self-sabotage or something, because that it could be a whole. Yeah. program couldn't it 
It's something we all struggle oh, with. Absolutely. No. Yes. Uh-huh. So perfect, guys. I hope you guys are having a wonderful Friday morning. Please have a very safe, safe weekend. Um, Lots of love to all you guys. Hold the line. Remember, you are special. You are loved. And you are sovereign. All right, guys. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Bye.